for retirement. How much money would you need for retirement? These are questions that are very important when it comes to retirement planning. That is what we do at UF Coffee Financial Group. We help you make sure that you don't outlive your money at retirement. We make sure that even if you have a 401k or you have a retirement plan, or do you have a retirement plan? Where do you intend to spend your retirement? How much money would you need for retirement? These are questions that are very important when it comes to retirement planning. That is what we do at UF Coffee Financial Group. We help you make sure that you don't outlive your money at retirement. We make sure that even if you have a 401k or you have a retirement plan already in place, we make sure that it is the right plan for you. Whether you just left an old employer, we help you to roll over your 401k. Whether you want to set up an IRA, we help you to do that. There are various ways of planning for retirement, but you need to do it with an expert. Call us today at 347-499-1618. Email us at info at ufcoffee.com or speak to any of our account reps and we will help you make sure that you have the right retirement plan that is suitable for your goals. I am Ursula Kofi, a financial service consultant and also the corporate president for UF Coffee Financial Group. Thank you. My name is Ursula Kofi. I'm a financial service consultant and also the corporate president for UF Coffee Financial Group. One of the things we do here at UF Coffee Financial Group is to provide financial service planning. When it comes to life insurance, mostly we put it as the last thing on the list. But let me tell you, to provide financial security for your family, to make sure that even when you are here or not, they still have the financial comfort that you would want them to have, life insurance is one of the ways to go. It creates instant wealth for them. Life insurance also ensures that whether you are here or not, the goals and the dreams of your kids comes to pass. Get a life insurance policy today with UF Coffee Financial Group. You can call us at 347-499-1618 or any of our account reps and they will help you with a policy for you and your family. The right choice that makes sense to you and also makes sense to your budget.
Let your word come with salvation and deliverance for your people. And let us leave your presence and walk right into your presence as people that are liberated. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Somebody give God some praise. You take whatever place. you Come on, give him praise. Give him your best praise. Come on, let's give God some praise. God bless you. You may take your seat. Praise the Lord. We serve a faithful God and we could worship him all day. Day and night. Night and day. <laughs> I love that song. It blesses my heart. Amen. And so this morning I want to welcome you into the presence of the Lord. The Bible makes very clear that in the presence of the Lord... There is liberty. It means that if I find myself entangled, I find myself in a situation of negativity, if you will, as long as I can drag myself. Because it's so easy to stay away from the presence of God when we're going through stuff. We say, well, I'm too sick to go into the presence of the Lord. I feel so depressed to go into the presence of the Lord. But what God really wants you to understand is that there is deliverance, there is salvation, there is breakthrough. All the things you are seeking for are in his presence. And so the enemy, knowing that, will do everything to make sure you don't come into the presence of the Lord. And sometimes all you need to do is to drag your depressed self. <laughs> if you really want to come out of depression, what do you do? You drag your depressed self into the presence of the Lord with the understanding that if I can drag this depressed self of me into his presence, I will leave yes. delivered. I will go back set free. And so if you are here this morning, I want it to be an expectation. God will turn things around Amen. for you. And if you are joining virtually, it is no different for you because the power of God has no limitation. The power of God doesn't know boundaries. He will scale every wall. I like that song that we sing. He will climb every mountain. He will go through any valley. He will go through anything just to make sure he comes to love on you. And so wherever you are this morning, I want you to know God has you on his mind and he has a word tailored for you. And if you believe it, say amen to him. Amen. amen. I want you to lift your right hand and say, Lord, I came here to hear your voice. No, say to him again, Lord, I came here so I may hear your voice. So, Lord, please speak to me. I need direction. I need clarity in my spirit. Let your word bring me that clarity. Let your word this morning bring me direction. For every facet of my life. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. Now this morning I want to share with you a few thoughts from the word of God. That I believe will change our lives. Because that is what the word of God is supposed to do. It's supposed to change our lives. Amen. Bible says anytime you hear the word of God. If you went back the same way you came. It means that you are just like a man that woke up in the morning. Looked at his face in the mirror. And with all the drool and all the mess in the face, that person stormed out of the house, giving no regard to all the things he saw on his face. It means that any time we come into contact with the word of God, it exposes something in our lives that needs to be changed, needs to be improved, needs to be fine-tuned. There is something always that you want to call work in progress in your life. And the word of God would point you to that. And if you walk away taking those words that comes out of the presence of God and not do anything about it, you know what you become? You become like a crazy man that seems to be doing the same thing over and over again, hoping that a different result will come out of it. Now, if you want a different result, you do something different. 
There is no way you're going to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result to come. So this morning, if you want to see a real change in your life, in your relationship, in your marriage, in your family, in your career, you must be determined to do something totally different. And what I, what I want to talk about is emotions. Emotions. It's one of the things we, uh, you know, take for granted. It's one of the things that doesn't look so important. But I want you to know that God gave you emotions for a reason. Some of us may not even realize that where we are today is as a result of how we have managed our emotions. Some of you, God provided a job for you, and that job was supposed to be the place God designed for you to put together capital for the business is birthed in your spirit. But you allowed your emotions to get a better part of you, and so you walked away because of the kind of people that were in that working environment. You just couldn't handle it. Some of us today are married because we just couldn't deal with a person God gave to us. Our emotions took the better part of us. And so we just didn't know how to manage our emotions. But I wanted to know, emotions are not from the devil. Emotions are from God. It took emotions for God through Jesus to take a whip and beat people out of the temple. You know, one of the uh, pastors in Africa is actually a bishop. He, he is the pastor of one of the biggest denominations in the whole world. One day, he did an altar call, and a bunch of people came to the front, and he was praying for them. He got to one young lady and asked, who are you? And the lady said, I'm a witch for Jesus Christ. The man of God took his hand and gave the lady a big slap on the face. And it went viral on social media. Everybody was asking, how can a man of God slap a young lady because she says she's a witch for the Lord? The man of God slapped her and said, you dare not call yourself a witch for my God because my God has no witch. Now, we could debate this all day, but I, I can't explain why he did what he did. The only thing I can explain is that Jesus also took a cane and beat people in the church who were doing business rather than seeking the business of the kingdom. So I can't tell you why he did what he did. I can't even tell whether he was right or wrong. I don't know. But I can tell you one thing, that there was emotions at play. Now, how you manage your emotions is key. How you manage the emotions God gave you. And please don't forget this. Bible says you and I were created in the image of God. And if the Bible says grieve not the Holy Spirit, it's an indication that the Holy Spirit has emotions. Because grieving has to do with emotions. It means if you have emotions, you are just reflecting God. And every single one of us born again, born of the Spirit of God, we are born into the image of God. We have the exact image of God, even though for the most part we're not acting like Him. We still possess His image. And that is why God wants us to understand how emotions are supposed to be managed. A lot of people try to hide their feelings, but we forget that our eyes can speak. So even though you try so hard, so hard to hide your emotions, there are, there are all kinds of body parts that can also communicate. Now, the subject of emotions, I realize, that opens up a kind of worm for most believers. A lot of believers, and I'm talking about people that are born again, sanctified by the blood, they have learned to walk in victory over sicknesses and have claimed God's promises. And I'm talking to everybody listening to me. If you are born again, we've been able to do that. We've claimed God's promises, his blessings, but we have not been able to live a daily life of an emotional victory. We are living a daily life of emotional roller coaster as believers. So today we are happy, tomorrow we have joy, next after that we have all kinds of negative emotions. I'm feeling depressed, I feel down, I feel suicidal. Now you got to be careful, it, if, it's, if it's just a one time thing I can understand. But you wake up in the morning, you go to work depressed, you get into that office, you are walking in fear. Every step you hear in that office puts you into a state of anxiety. And you come home, you can't go to sleep. 
and then that cycle continues in your life for an extended period, you cannot ignore that. You can't shake that off by yourself. You need a power that is bigger than you to shake that off. And it is a scheming of the enemy to keep you in that prison of emotional torture. But God wants you this morning to come out of every prison of emotions. God never created you and gave you salvation for you to remain in the captivity of emotions. Some of you get all kinds of palpitation when you see certain people walk by. The moment you see that person, your heart begins to go. Because somebody just came into the neighborhood. It's just a reflection of something that is going on that must be confronted. And a good number of us are just sweeping it under the carpet. Only to show up another day. Some today are anxious over many things and walk in bitterness. And I'm talking about believers. We walk in bitterness. And I'm talking about bitterness from past hurt. And isn't it amazing that dead people today control us? Even as a nation. A lot of dead people control folks. There is somebody that raped you when you were 15 years. You can't just let go. You can't forgive. The person possibly is dead and gone. But the person still controls your life. You are in a marriage, you are not happy, you are in a relationship, you are not fulfilled because you are still suspicious of that person because you feel he's just like that person that raped you when you were young. And the enemy is using all the memories of yesterday to keep you in this captivity so that you don't enjoy the blessings God is bringing your way even in the now. Now, I know one thing, that we serve a God that doesn't consult the past to determine our present. He wouldn't even consult the past to determine our future. It means what God is doing should never be compared with yesterday. He says, behold, I do a new thing, the former things I do no more. Is that in your Bible? That is what the Bible says. God says, I do a new thing. It means he wants you to move away. Yes, there are so many things we could potentially learn from the past. There are so many things God will want us to have considered, having taken us through many years of experience, mature, but it should never imprison you. And knowing how to manage emotions will be possibly for some of us the only thing that stands between us and our next level. Because some of us have taken that test over and over again. You walked away from that business. You walked away from that company. You walked away from that job only to enter into a new one with the same character showing up. You like again? Yes, again, because you never passed the first test. God never gives a new instruction past your last disobedience. Can you think about that for a minute? God never gives a new direction. He will never give you a new instruction when you consistently fail to um, respond to his previous instruction to us. Some of us walk away from places designed by God for us, hoping that the next place we go will not have the same set of challenges. But those challenges are for your good. Those challenges are for your maturing. Sometimes God brings certain people and they might be so wicked. They might be so treacherous. They might be so terrible. But they are designed by God to propel you into your destiny. And that is why I like folks like Joseph. Joseph was not beat out with his brothers even though they placed him in a pit. They placed him in a place that was so hateful. Not only did they place him in a pit, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. And after they were done selling him to the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelites also sold him into slavery into the house of Potiphar. But all these things were signed off by God because it was all intended to prepare him for the ultimate place God had designed for him. Is somebody listening to me? So here we are, I'm upset with my brothers because they put me in a pit. I'm upset with my brothers because they sold me to the Ishmaelites. I'm upset with my brothers because they sold me uh, through the Ishmaelites to, to the house of Potiphar. But I forget that God is preparing me and bringing me closer to the dreams he revealed to me many years ago. He revealed to me I was going to be a leader of my entire family. He revealed to me that I was going to be a leader of a whole nation. He revealed to me that I was going to be a prime minister in a strange land. But God is orchestrating events that are unpopular events that hurt events that are uncomfortable but every single one of them is bringing me closer to his purpose for my life 
So am I going to be emotionally upset with my brethren who did ugly things to me, yet God takes advantage of every single one of them, bringing me closer to his purpose for my life. And so here am I in the house of Potiphar learning how to uh, govern without going to a school that would teach me. Right where I am in slavery in the house of Potiphar, God is teaching me because Potiphar was in government. And God is teaching me how to govern through that man. Even in prison, God is exposing me to the prison system of which I was to become the prime minister of the nation. How am I going to learn all these things without going to these places? Yet I will see the negativity. That is why I refuse to see that which the enemy projects. Because what he projects is negativity. But you know what I realize? I realize that in every storm there is a calm. And if you're a believer, you must understand that peace is not absence of war. Some of you are waiting for the war to end for you to enjoy peace. No, there is calm in the storm. In fact, peace is not absence of war. Peace is actually calmness in the midst of chaos. It means that you can be going through chaos and still have calmness in your heart because you serve the Prince of Peace. You can be surrounded by all kinds of turmoil and still be at peace without going through anxiety because of the one who goes through it with you. That is why the four Hebrew boys, I call them four Hebrew boys, because there was an ultimate fourth Hebrew boy with them. The three Hebrew boys walked in that fire. They did not scream. The three Hebrew boys walked through it even though it was burning beyond normal because of who was walking in those fires with them. I want you to know whatever you're going through this morning, you are not alone. Amen. You are not alone. This morning, Brother Kofi said something during the opening prayer. He said, when you get employed anywhere, you are given, of course, if it's, if it's a legit business, some businesses won't give you, they'll give you some verbal instructions that keep changing but if you were employed in a legit company you are going to be given what is called an employee handbook and if you're a union worker there is something called collective bargaining agreement that every unionized employee is given and so these two set of books are supposed to reveal to you what your rights are as an employee what you're entitled to, talk about family vacation, talk about disability, talk about slip and fall on the work, talk about unemployment insurance. All these things are spelled out in the handbook. But then if you don't know, of course, every minute you're going to call HR. And a lot of us today, that is what we do all day, calling HR of heaven. God, what do you have for me today? And he's like, have you checked the employee handbook, the Bible? God, what am I supposed to do about this situation? And he's like, have you checked the employee handbook? Because there is nothing new under the sun. The Bible says anything you are going through, anything you have been through, anything you will go through in the future is all covered in the employee handbook. I want you to know that there is nothing in God that is missing. There is nothing that is broken. There is nothing God is scratching his head and thinking, how am I going to solve this? Everything that would ever happen, God knew it. Bible says there is nothing new and answer. God knows it all. That is why he's called Jehovah Omniscient, the Lord that is all knowing. And so every situation you are going through, he has already provided the answer in his word. And I dare you to ask him, what is it? Because the young folks are like, oh yeah, pastor, I hear you, but you know, there are things that are happening right now that didn't used to happen back in the days. What is happening? AI. It's all in the Bible. Some of us don't even understand what the Bible says in the last days. Knowledge shall abound. The level of knowledge, the level of information, Bible says will be crazy. Crazy. So what is new under the sun? Bible says everything, everything you could potentially think about. Like I, I, I will meet a couple of pastors that are frustrated about virtual ministry. Folks don't want to come into the building. I say if they don't want to come into the building, ta-da, wake up. God is telling you that times and seasons have changed. Yes. Isn't it God that says I will do a new thing? Yes. So why are you giving credit to the devil and saying that technology is of the devil, social media is of the devil? The devil has no bone of creation. Amen. 
The best the devil does is to take that which God creates and pervert it for his own agenda. Creation is of God. Amen. Creation is of God. Amen. The guy who created television, he says the reason why I'm creating television is to tell a vision. That was the meaning of television. And the devil, of course, would take that and use it for his own agenda. And so God allows all these creation to happen. And I love it. Look at the way God preceded this season we are living in. He preceded it with what we call pandemic. But God had to place a pause on the whole world. And you dare tell me that it is the devil that created a pandemic. It's because you don't know God. Read your Bible. You know what God says? God says, I'm the creator of good and evil. It's in your Bible. He says, I'm the creator. Some of us are like, no, 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 that can't be, can, can be God. You feel embarrassed to associate evil with God. <laughs> and I said, that is how hypocritical we are as believers. And that's why I said last week, if you have a, 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 a funeral home and business is slow, what kind of prayer are you going to pray? A funeral home. Lord, business is slow. You got to do something. What are you trying to say? God kill more people? We're so hypocritical. We don't want to represent the kingdom that we claim to be part of. I shared with you the story of the young man that was so reckless. He grew up and he was just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But prior to that, he ran into a problem and this man came around and saved him. He was a little baby. But after he grew up, he was doing all kinds of crazy stuff, getting into the problems with the law, being arrested, being ticketed, being sent to jail. Finally, he's brought to court. He stands before the judge, and he remembers that the judge is the same judge that saved him when he was a young boy. And so the judge is about to pass sentence, and he says, Your Majesty, Your Highness, I have a statement to make. And then he goes, Oh, Please, I just wanted to remind you that I'm the young boy that, you know, 35 years ago you saved. Trying to get a pass with a judge. And the judge says, yes, I think I remember you. When you were a young kid, you ran into that problem and I saved you. But today I'm not your savior, I'm your judge. I'm just trying to let somebody understand that there is a season where God is your savior. But a day is going to come where he's going to be a judge. And it's not going to hand out anymore. And that is why we must see the two natures of God. We cannot just see him as an everlasting, an ever long-suffering God. Bible calls him long-suffering. Not ever suffering. It means though it is long, it is not forever. There's an end. And we got to see the two natures of God. That even though he loves us, when he gets into the place of judgment, there is no room for love. He says on that day, he will separate the goats from the sheep. He says on that day, he will say to one stand on my right and to one stand on my left. He says on that day, he will send some to hell, burning with fire. And he will say to some also, thou good and faithful servant, come into my rest. We're talking about the same God who loves. He said, Esau I have hated and Jacob I have loved. And then he goes on to say, is there unrighteousness with God? No, he answers. So we cannot only see one side of God and run with it. And so when there is pandemic, we say it is the devil. Please don't mistake the miracles of God and give the credit to the devil. God brought a pandemic as a transition to the new season. I tell folks, I tell pastors that are like, oh, virtual ministry is not, it's not God. It is the devil. I said, because you limit the power of God. You know, Jesus met a man, and by the time Jesus was done conversating with a man, Sister Rosalind, Jesus looked at that man and said, the whole of Israel, I've never seen anybody with this kind of faith. Why did Jesus just say that? Because the man requested for a Zoom meeting. No, the man had a child that was sick. And Jesus was so busy. Jesus was like, when I'm done, I'll come to your house to heal the child. 
And do you know what a man said? He said, sir, I'm a man under authority. I say to one, come, they come. I say to one, go, they go. So you don't have to come to my house. Just speak virtually. Just speak virtually and my child will be healed. So that is why those of you on Facebook right now, the word is coming with power to you. Those of you on YouTube and Zoom, you can receive the word in power. Because that is what Jesus did. Bible says he prayed for that child that was several miles away from the location where they were. And the Bible says that suddenly, that same time Jesus was praying, the child got healed. How dare you limit the power of God? That is why you can pray for somebody in the Caribbean right now from here and the person will get healed. That is the power of God. Glory to Jesus. Amen. So virtual is of God and not of the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now when we talk about emotions, there are so many things we got to talk about. Because some of you are getting ready to marry, but you don't even understand the place of emotions in your relationship. And that is why you, you know, dating all kinds of boys and girls, like you're testing out cars <laughs> from the dealership. <laughs> you're doing a test drive. Test drive. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, help us. Say, Lord, help me. Ah. Now, like I said before, some are anxious over many things. Some are even walking in bitterness as believers, and these bitterness are even as a result of past heads. Well, for others, it, it's not just, you know, bitterness from past heads, but controlling jealousy. Uh, some it is rage. Some it is anger. And, and to most it is an unending, an unending struggle that we go through. You're like, I think I've overcome. I think I'm victorious. That is why God is bringing us a word that will cause us to walk in victory over all these emotions the enemy would like to throw at us. Now, to all of us that are struggling in different aspects of, you know, these emotional challenges, which I want to call negative emotions, God wants to give us freedom from these negative feelings. And I tell you what, when you get delivered from these negative emotions, I tell you it surpasses deliverance from sicknesses like cancer. Yes, to get out of that... <laughs> Because in desperation, some believers today have even sought the counsel of secular psychiatrists or psychologists. You know, they go out there seeking for help. You know, because we're desperate. We just want to come out of these emotional challenges. And, and, and we seek all kinds of uh, secular professionals to help us. But we know one thing. The world system is going to teach us, you got to cope. They teach us coping mechanism. Our God doesn't just come around and give us some kind of medication and coping mechanism. No, that doesn't represent our God. He gives us deliverance. He breaks the back of the enemy and sets us free. And I believe that is what God is bringing us this morning to give us total deliverance from every form of negative emotion that has held us down. God wants you to come out of it. If you believe it, say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> Now, when we go out there, we are only told that, you know, just cope with it. You must learn to accept yourself. That is what they tell us out there, accepting the good with the evil or the good with the bad. The reason is you are the way you are because, uh, some will even tell you, it's because of your childhood environment, the environment you grew up in. That is why you are what you are today. So you got to accept yourself. You know, you got abused by your father, you got abused by your parents, your uncle, whoever the case may be. Accept yourself that way. Now, if I wanted to accept myself that way, man, I would have been slapping my wife all day. I would have been beating my kids all day. Joe, you know what I mean? I would be doing some crazy stuff. Talking about my environment, man, my father was crazy. I mean crazy. So if I was to allow my environment to detect what kind of a father I would be or what kind of a husband I would be, 
Man, there was no day my father didn't see me. Now, if you grew up in some African homes, your good morning doesn't come verbally. It comes with some kind of, yeah. yeah. Good morning is not like good morning. You know what I mean? You wake up in the morning, they hold your ears. Have you brushed your teeth today? <laughs> now, you come in the morning to the living room and daddy meets you and he's like, have you brushed your teeth today? That's the good morning you got in Africa. In some places. So don't get, at least my home I can testify. America things are different. When you go to sleep, you're like, honey, have a good night. Have a good night, honey. Now in Africa, some places you're like, did you lock the door? Have you checked the windows? No, it's different. Your environment can really frame your mind. It can turn you to somebody that has a lot of phobia. So even though you are in America where security is different, you, you, your, your body is in Af America, but your mind is still in Africa. That is why there are African men that have lived in America for 20 years. They would never kiss their wife in public. It's a taboo. Growing up, we never saw daddy and mommy do anything like that. Brother Gerald, am I right? <laughs> now I'm just trying to help somebody understand that as a child of God when you get born again Bible says you are translated from the kingdom of this world whether it's the kingdom of Africa the kingdom of the Caribbean the kingdom of America whatever kingdom you belong to and you've now been brought into the kingdom of his dear son where things are done totally different and so you don't belong to the kingdoms of this world anymore you belong to the kingdom of God and so you seek to do things the way the kingdom of God does it. I'm not going to do my marriage the way my father did it, my mom did it. Yes, there are some good examples I could potentially learn from them. But what does the book tell me to do? It says, husband, love your wives. And wives, submit. How does the Bible teach me? That must be my model and not the model of the world. The Bible makes very clear that there are two genders. And I got to know that. Everything God wants you to know is in his word. Amen. So we do not allow the world to teach us how we got to do things. Man, I, I grew up with my father that was always under the influence. Talk about the influence. Influence of alcohol. And I, when I talk about the alcohol, you, it's alcohol you have never known. Some of you think you drink. You think you drink vodka. You, dr you drink tequila. You drink what, what else do you guys drink? What do you drink? Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Yeah. Hennessy. What else do you drink? Jasterinian Brooks. JMB. <laughs> Modelo. Corona. You drink all this crazy stuff, right? Now, you you now, every single one of these drinks have what they call the alcohol in it recorded on the label. My father drinks something that was labelless. It was label. It has no label. In fact, some of the things he drank, you couldn't bring it close to fire. It will flame up. <laughs> Those of you from Africa, you know what I'm talking about. Jamaicans talk about rum. You haven't seen this one. No, I'm talking about alcohol that when it is being distilled, and you pass by the neighborhood, your walking can change. Just passing by the neighborhood where it is being brewed. Yes. And some of this alcohol is made from nails. No, I'm, I'm that's it's made from metals. They put these nails in water to rust and they make alcohol out. It's just like the prison system in America. They do what they call pooch. The prisoners are so desperate, they use the toilet bowl, the water in the toilet bowl to make alcohol. They call it pooch. Some of you don't know. You are so blessed. That's how they make alcohol in the prisons. Yeah. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So, am I going to look at my environment to determine the kind of family I raise? I never had any example, but my examples are recorded in the word of God. My father will beat every single one of us the moment he gets home. For no reason. Beat us. And, you know, 
I was living with my grandmother and my father at the same time. And I remember at the time, my grandmother is like, if I don't take these kids away from this house, my son is going to kill all of them because my father will beat us till we start bleeding. And it's not because we've done anything. The man was under the influence of crazy stuff. He was smoking everything smokable. And he was drinking everything drinkable. The guy in, in Africa, we, our, five, our, our high schools were five-year uh, uh, you know, um, program. Every year, this guy got kicked out from a high school. <laughs> the guy did five years of high school in five different schools. It got to a point no school would even want to, want to have him. I remember one, one of the biggest things he did that caused sensation. I, I didn't know some of these things. Recently, I called one of my aunties. I wanted to know some history of the family. And she was telling me something that blew my mind. He said one of the schools, the final schools that he went to, in fact, that was the last one. He got kicked out before he wrote his finals. He wrote the finals from home. But then he said one of the serious things he did that brought even government into it was that that school had peace corps representatives serving in that school. And one day he went to the dining room late and a peace corp officer standing in front said he wouldn't allow him. He gave him, I mean, uh, man. <laughs> he gave him, oh my goodness. And he had no limit. He had no limit. He beat this guy. It became a government issue. My grandmother used to sell clothes. She was very rich selling, you know, Holland, clothes from Holland. And uh, during the um, revolution, they, they came, the soldiers came, took all these things away uh, to, to, to the prison, you will call it. My father goes in and asks them, I want my mother's clothes back. <laughs> They're like, you're crazy. You know who you're dealing with. And these guys have guns and what have you. My father kills the counter of the prison. I mean, the prison get to the back, picks up his mother's clothes, and off he goes. <laughs> he was a crazy guy. Now, are you going to look at all these things? And I know every one of you listening to me this morning has a crazy person in your family. And are you going to look at these things to determine the future you build for your family? No. My father was dead at the age of 40 years. He drank his life away, drank his kidney away. And I, I want to talk to those of you young folks that think it's so cute to have some, uh, you know, um, Ciroc. <laughs> Anytime you take alcohol, you are killing your liver. Yeah, you're killing, you're killing some organs in your body, young folks. Read what King Lemuel's mother told him in a book of, maybe we should read that. Can you put that on a screen? Is it uh, Proverbs 31? King Lemuel's mother's advice to him. He said, it is not for kings to drink beer. Give me the NIV translation. He says, don't give your strength to women. Some of you, you see anything in sketch, you want it. Yeah. Selling your wild oats. You don't realize that you soon, look at what the Bible says. It says, do not spend your strength on what? He didn't say woman, woman. Your vigor, the young ones. Your vigor on what? Those who ruin kings. You think you are selling, oh, I had that one. I had that one. I had that one. The, the young ones, when they made that's what they did. I have that one. <clears throat> You're invested in child support. <laughs> These are 21 years investment. They become mature after 21 years. You're going to be paying child support for 21 years. And some of these girls are walking around. They are looking for investors. This guy looks like a potential rich guy. If I can get one with that one, one with this one, I'm done. I'm set for life. I don't have to work again. And you two, you are having fun. Foolishness in high places. Oh, yeah. Read the word. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to crave Corona. Heineken. It's right there. Don't you see beer? Modelo. And then you come to church, we are royal priesthood. We are a peculiar nation. I'm royalty. 
So you are king, you are prince. He says if you are king, you are prince. Act like one. Amen. Stop chasing the girls around. Respect them. If I, if you're a young man, you should be afraid to touch unmarried girls. Because the Bible says you're married is married to the Lord. You know what that means? When you touch them, you're touching God's wife. You're not scared? The unmarried is married to God. Amen. You know, if you're a young man sitting by your mother, your mother will give you some faces right now. <laughs> Your mother will not speak. She'll just give us a look. It's like what he said is for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now, do you still like me? Well, it's okay. Even if you don't like me, God loves me. And that's enough for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I don't know where all this is coming from. We're supposed to be talking about emotions, but it's part of it. It's emotions that is driving you off the ledge. Look at the book of Deuteronomy. Let me show you how God's emotion looks like. The book of Deuteronomy 28 verse 45. Listen, God has emotions just like you. And it's okay for you to have emotions, but God wants you to take charge of your emotions. Don't allow your emotions to drive you crazy. Deuteronomy 24, verse 45, and then we skip over to 47. It says, Moreover, all these curses will come on you. They will pursue you and overtake you. Is that what it says? Deuteronomy 28, verse 45, and then I want to read 47. It says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes with it, which he commanded you. Look at what he said. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with what? Joy. He says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with what? Emotions. And gladness of heart. It means even our service to God requires us to do it with emotions. For the abundance of everything. I'm just trying to let you know that emotions is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If it is properly managed. Because God even requires you to worship him with joy and gladness. Which is what? Emotions. Now here in this scripture, just as we read. He is angry with this group of Israelites for not serving him with gladness or with emotions. He is making this very clear that don't even come to me because you're going to be cursed if your worship to me is just talk. You know how he says it in the New Testament? He says these people talk about me with their mouth, but their heart, their emotions are far away from me. It means that two must go together. Whatever I'm saying must go together with the state of my heart. Hallelujah. So we can see that it's much a matter of choice to serve God with gladness as it is to serve him even in the first place. We just can't serve him without our heart. It's just like you give it. Bible says don't give grudgingly. And grudgingly has to do with an, a state of emotion. It says you must give what cheerfully. That has to do with emotions as well. You know, recently we all read in the news of um, this young man called Bob Lee. This guy is the one that developed the app called Cash App. We read just a few weeks ago, a young man uh, stabbed him. Initially, we didn't know who, who, who stabbed him, but then we, we learned from the story later on that a young man had stabbed him. And this young man, when they began to trace, they realized that this young man was with him a few hours before his death. And um, as I was looking at the story, I could only see emotions at play. Because of even the tool he used to kill him. He didn't use a regular knife. He used a kitchen knife. And then when I read the text that this killer's sister texted the victim moments after or before. We don't know whether it was before or after he died. He texted him and said, I'm sorry for my brother's reaction. He said, I'm sorry. Because they were just coming from her apartment. 
Bob Lee and the girl's brother. They, they had a challenge because the guy thinks that Bob Lee has made a sister get into drug addiction. And they had their back and forth. And so they leave, and this young man decides to give Bob Lee a ride. And he drives him to this dark place in San Francisco. They are seen on surveillance, having a conversation, and next day, no, he takes this kitchen knife and stabs him three times, two of those stabbings into his heart. This guy falls to the ground and dies. The question to ask is that what drove this guy to this place? It's called emotions emotions that has gone haywire emotions that are not managed it means that even god even though god gave us emotions he expects you and i to have victory over emotions he expects you to take charge of it he doesn't expect your life to be ruined by emotions now this young man is facing uh, murder he's facing 26 years to life in prison because of one small decision he took. It looked small at the time. It looked simple. It looked like, well, this is the only thing I'm going to do to make sure that my, my, my sister doesn't continue with this drug habit. I think about people like Moses. You read the Bible. Bible says that Moses has life going for him. He has everything working for him. I mean, think about it. Who wouldn't want to be in the king's palace? Who wouldn't want to be raised by the uh, king's daughter, the princess? Who wouldn't want to be the future leader of a nation? Who wouldn't want to be honored and bowed to by all the citizens of the nation? I mean, he went to the best school. He lived in the best neighborhood. He ate the best of food. He was living in royalty. The Bible says one day. This man was 40 years. One day he goes out and he realizes that the people of Israel were being maltreated by the Egyptians. And so you know what he did? Bible says he saw two of them fighting, an Egyptian and an Israelite. The Bible says that he looked to the left, he looked to the right, he looked in front of him, he looked behind him, didn't look up. <laughs> and the Bible says that what does he do? He strangled this guy and killed him and buried him in the sand. And then he went on with his life as if nothing has happened. And the Bible says next time he came around, he saw two people arguing, just like the previous one. And then when he made his first move, one of them said, who made you a judge over us? Are you trying to kill me like you killed the other one the other day? He knew he had been exposed. And so when Pharaoh got to know, Pharaoh wanted to kill him because he had committed murder and he needed to face, face the law. So guess what he did? A man had, had built a whole future over 40 years. Now this man has to go into exile for another 40 years for a decision he took. He could not control his emotions. I'm just trying to help us understand how we not being in control of our emotions can redefine the rest of our days. We're not taking charge of our emotions. And words are so easy. They come out so easy. But words are spirit. They are so powerful. They have the ability to manifest. And so you don't just want to talk loosely because you are angry. And sometimes when you have said the wisest thing to do is to keep quiet. But some of us don't know how to control our mouth. Oh man, our mouth will run like dripping rain when we are upset. We don't know when to pull the plugs. We will go on and on and on. Hallelujah. Now, but understand one thing that God created you and I in his image. What that means is that you and I have emotions just like God has emotions. So for us to operate like God will want us to operate, we must learn from God. We got to look at the way God uses emotions for good and not using emotions to destroy like most of us would do. Bible says that our God is a jealous God. Did you know that? But how does God use his jealousy? Some of us, <laughs> we have no idea how to operate in jealousy. It's there. In fact, every married person have what is called legitimate jealousy. It is a good jealousy. In fact, if your spouse is not jealous about you, they don't love you. So jealousy is necessary for every relationship. But it is called legitimate jealousy. Simply put, I love you so much, I don't want to share you with anybody. That is what legitimate le uh, jealousy is about. I love you so much, I don't want to share you with anybody. 
And anybody that loves you will have that kind of jealousy towards you. And the Bible says that God is a jealous God. In the book of Exodus 20 verse 5. I look at all the emotions of God. Bible says God laughs. In fact, you read a book of Psalms 2 verse 4. Bible says there is a God who sits in heaven and this God will laugh. Some of us can laugh. We can't laugh because of the bills. We can't laugh because of the credit card bills. We can't laugh because of the mortgage. We can't laugh because of our kids. Our kids have taken laughter from us. God wants you to laugh. Amen. You know, there are reasons to laugh and sometimes there must be no reason to laugh at all. <laughs> when was the last time you laughed? Look at somebody in their face and say, brother, laugh. <laughs> now tell that person, come on, laugh. Laughter is medicine for the soul. Is that not what the Bible says? Amen. Laughter is medicine. <laughs> now I realize something that even God's creation loves. Even angels express emotions. You look at even animals, those of you who have pets. They express emotions because they are part of God's creation. They do have emotions. But a question for us to answer this morning as we come to the concluding part of this sermon is what are emotions? First of all, I want to say emotions are the spice of life. They are what? The spice of life. Tell somebody emotions are the spice of life. Those of you on social media, type it out in a chat room, on your comment box. Emotions are the spice of life. Now, when I say they are the spice of life, what I'm trying to say is that they do not add substance to life. <laughs> Hallelujah. They do not add what? Substance to life. But they do add flavor to life. They are the places we find enjoyment, we find excitement. And just like spices, they do not sustain life. They add flavor to life's experiences. Sometimes you watch a game, somebody scores and suddenly the footballer gets into this mood of dancing. He, he just added flavor. But he's not going to dance throughout the entire game. They must go back to continue with the game. It's just like a footballer making a touchdown. He gets excited. That's something cra crazy. Some of them will even flip. I see people do all kinds of crazy stuff just to express their joy. But do you realize that all those antennas, all those flipping, all those jumping and dancing doesn't add any points to the game. It doesn't. You know, the referee wouldn't say, because you flipped three times, I'm going to add three points. No, no. It's just, it's just a flavor. It's just a spice. It doesn't add anything to the game. It doesn't add to the scoreboard. It doesn't add to the point. But one thing we can say is that it adds to the enjoyment of the game. It does. And that is what emotions are supposed to do. The cause us to appreciate life. They cause us to understand that in the midst of even our storm, we could still celebrate the goodness of God. And sometimes it is the way we choose to see things that are happening around us because some of us are so focused on the negativity because of the experiences we've gone through in life. But even in the midst of the storm, the negativity, there is always something good that is happening in the environment that we can choose to focus on. So the question then is that, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the challenge? Are you focusing on the negativity? Are you focusing on the things that hurt? Or you are focusing on the good that is even in the hurt? This morning, I want to leave you with a couple of things that I believe will help you. Because a good number of us today listening have become victims of wicked emotions. You know, um, the other day I was reading the Washington Post. And the Washington Post said, 
throughout the four-year presidency of President Donald Trump, he lied 30,573 times, making statements that were either lies untrue or misleading. Now, I want to say I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I am what I'm led to vote for on election day. Because sometimes when you make statements, you know, people take it out of context and uh, make you feel, you know, you, you, you belong, you represent a party. You know, one of the famous lies Donald Trump had said was that, uh, you know, uh, on, on the day he won, he said, well, you know, we got 306 electoral college votes. The highest and the biggest win ever since Ronald Reagan. And truth be told, it wasn't even 306. Brother Kofi, it was 304. <laughs> and not only that, I looked at all the statistics of the presidents that came after him, which he claimed he did better than all of them. You look at George uh, Walker Bush. <laughs> he got 426. And you tell me you're 304. It's bigger and better than them. Of course, R R Ronald, Ronald Reagan's uh, record is crazy. I don't know how he got it. 525. That's the highest. But George Bush got 426. So how did your 306 or 304 become bigger than them? <laughs> I think about Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, even in 1992, got 370 votes, which is more than his 304. In 96, he got 379, more than his, you know, 304. Even Barack Obama got 365 in 2008. And the sad thing is that a lot of pastors even began to join these um, lies and created all this emotional charge in the atmosphere. Until today, the man has not even accepted that he lost the election. <laughs> and not only that, a lot of believers believe what he says. And it is all about emotions at play. There are families that are broken over these news. You wouldn't, you, man, uh, there is this uh, lady that I always think about. I think she, her last name is Conway. Uh, she, she represents Donald Trump and her husband is a hardcore <laughs> Democrat who hates the guts of Donald Trump. And I'm wondering, how can these two people be married? And the wife is the number one defender of Donald Trump. And the husband is the number one enemy of Donald Trump. How do they go home to be together as husband and wife? And you will see them on TV debating and saying the direct opposite of what each of them represents. I'm talking about how we can open the door for negative emotions to wreck our home. Because of the lies of the enemy out there. Now, I want us to understand what God wants us to do in taking charge of our emotion. The first thing I want you to know is that you have the power of choice. Can we say that together? We have the power of choice. Look at the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. And I need you to get that you have the power of choice. If you are listening to me on Zoom, type that out. I have the power of choice. You're on Facebook, do the same thing. I have the power of choice. God wants you to choose wisely. Colossians 3 verse 8. Let's read a few verses. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things. Now remember, he says, who does it? Who does it? Me? The pastor? Stop coming to church and pastor, I want you to lay hands on me. Bind that demon of anger. He says, you... Who does it? You. You have an anger problem. You have the power to overcome. He says you must get rid of yourself of such things. What are the such things? Anger. Anger. You must rise up and say enough of that anger. That is why God gave you one of the fruits of the spirit called self-control. You know what? I'm upset, but I'm just going to take a walk. I'm so angry. If I sit in this environment, I'm going to explode. I'm just going to take a walk and cool off. You must begin to find things to do that puts you in a better state of emotions. 
There are certain negative emotions you never respond to. I remember many years ago, I used to work in a jewelry store on 32nd Street. A guy comes in and he tries to steal some jewelry. I don't know what came over me. I flipped behind. I mean, I was standing behind the counter. I flipped over, grabbed the guy, and I was a pastor. Now, I'm just trying to let you know nobody is exempted from this emotion things we are talking about. It can take hold of you in a split second. And you're like, what did I just do? I tell you, after I did all that, I asked myself, what if the guy had a knife? What if the guy had a gun? I'm like, what did I just do? Because I grabbed this guy. This guy was just struggling with me. He released himself and he ran through the door. I, I, I just chased this guy. I chased him all the way to Madison Square Building. And I left the whole jewelry store. <laughs> and then when I came back, I, I was like, what if some of the church members met you? I would tell them I went jogging. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bible says you must be the one that get rid of what? Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. No, sometimes I sit with folks and sometimes the words just come. It just come. Because their mouth is full of it. And they are like, oh, Pastor, forgive my French. I said that was not French. It was English. Shut up. He says, you must be the one that gets rid of it. So you stop blaming people. These kids are making me angry. No, you have a choice. This man I'm married to is always irritating me. You got choice. Listen, if all the things and the people around you are redefining who you are, you have not yet matured. If your actions are based off what people are doing to you, you are responding to every emotion that is thrown out, of, out to you, then you are not matured. I can tell you I have struggles and I still have struggles with emotions. But I can tell you one thing confidently. I'm not the same person I was yesterday. Because every day provides me an opportunity to be the better version of myself. Amen. And the more I grew in the word and in the Lord, the more I overcame all these weaknesses. It's a determination in the heart. It's a choice to make. I refuse to let your action change who I'm supposed to be. Amen. I will stay true to myself. God has given me the fruits of the spirit. And so I have patience. Amen. That is what God has given you. Patience. Amen. I remember I used to work with a guy. This guy was such a terrible guy. I don't know how I did it. I worked with this guy for one year without talking to him. One year. And that one year, I would come to church every Sunday and preach to the church people. <laughs> no, seriously. This guy tormented me, irritated me. I, I mean, he made me so angry. And I'm like, you know what? What you are doing, I know God placed me here. I'm not going to walk away, but I'm not going to talk to you. And this guy was the owner of the business, and I was working with him directly. The anger and the rage between us was so high. When he needed something from me, he would tell the other workers to come and tell me. When I also need something from him, I would tell the workers to go and tell him. And we did that for one year. One year. How I did that, I don't know. <laughs> that was no social distance. <laughs> Uh, that possibly could pass for emotional distance. <laughs> Amen. But look at what the Bible says. He says, you must get rid of it. You must get rid of this anger. You make a determination. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to allow what they're doing to determine who I turn out to be. I want to be a child of God who has patience, who has endurance, who has resilience. Your attitude will not change me. The only person that has the power to change me is God and his word. And if his word says I must be patient, I will be patient. If his word says I must suffer long, I will suffer long. I will not react to what you are doing. 
Because sometimes the enemy throws those things to you and then when you react, the next thing he says, and he calls himself a Christian. That's what he's seeking to do. And he calls himself a Christian. Now, they could have said that about me a few years ago. But today, folks at work come to me and be like, why are you always smiling? We never see you get angry. And I'm like, yeah, I work, I've conquered, but you should come to my house. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> I have no witness. <laughs> Amen. So this thing we are talking about is work in progress. Look at verse number 9, what it says. So he gives us the solution. The solution is for you to take charge, take responsibility. And you must be the one telling yourself, I'm going to do it. He says, do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self and its practices. Are you still lying to folks? Then you haven't changed. Look at the next thing he says. Let's go on. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. So knowledge is key. What we receive today is knowledge. Knowledge with which we are supposed to work with and make sure we turn out to be a better version of ourselves. If the temptation to lie come to you, would you let it control you? Would you do that? If you have a certain anger or a sudden you know, edge to lie, to, to sin. Would you give in? He says you have the power, you have the choice to overcome it. Anger, wrath, all this bitterness, malice. He says you have the power to tell yourself, I'm no longer going to do it. Amen. In verse 12, he says you've got to put on the knowledge of the word. Verse 11, put on the knowledge of the word and tender messages like clean clothing. That is what he says you should do. God tells us that sin, sins of emotions have no power over us than an old set of clothes. You can take it off. You can take it off. It, 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 might, it must just be like clothes. Clothes. Some people just can't handle it. They stand all day just arguing, proving their point. And I tell you, I have those tendencies. When you have my kind of personalities, you want to make sure you win every challenge. You win every argument. But then God wants to have his way in your heart. Amen. He wants to have his spirit at work in your heart. So he says you must be slow to wrath. You should not be soon angry. That is what the Bible says in Titus 1 verse 7. A few things that will help you. You know, things that I believe we should consider. Bible says in the book of Proverbs 12 verse 6, he says, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. It just exposes you as a fool. Now, I wanted to understand one thing as I end this teaching here. You know, this is based on the book of Proverbs 27 verse 4. He says, wicked emotions left unchecked will consume you like a flood. It will consume you. And I wanted to know the enemy will use your emotions to destroy you. He uses that. Your emotions. It's a place the enemy would use just to make sure you are destroyed. Some people will walk out of their marital home. Don't care about the kids they are leaving behind because they are emotionally charged. Somebody will take a gun and gun somebody down because they are emotionally charged. You know, somebody was sharing a story with us of a, a man that had lived all his life here for about 35 years you know he married a lady here and hadn't met the lady's kids so you know um he decides they they both decided they were building a home back in nigeria you know they did that i mean did everything you would expect anybody trying to retire back home to do they did that they packed they did a container load of stuff they took a lot of beautiful stuff home their plan was to go back home and settle and so they are met at the airport by the man's, the lady's only son, who, you know, this man was meeting for the first time. So happy. He had made a lot of shopping, bought a lot of stuff for this young man because he was meeting a young man for the first time physically, and he was so excited about it. And so, you know, they end up going home. They go to sleep at night, and in the night, their room is broken into. And this person comes into the room with a gun and, you know, maxed up and 
demanding for money and all the things they brought. And this man apparently had a gun on him. So while they were trying to open up and give the stuff to this uh, intruder that was, you know, robbing them, whatever, he grabbed his gun and shot the robber. Turn on the light, take off the, um, the mask. It turns out to be the lady's son. Who he had brought all these things for. He allowed his emotions to get a better part of him. That this man has brought so much money. I'm going to take a good portion of it. Did he realize that all the blessings were brought for him? And this was a true story. And I'm asking myself, what emotional state is that mother left in? What is the future of this union, this marriage? How are they going to deal with the, the future emotionally, even as they go along? Knowing that the stepfather had killed this boy, not because he wanted to murder him, but because this boy made an emotional decision. I'm going to get some money out of this man and live my best life. Listen, never you allow your emotions to lead you. Amen. Lead your emotions. Amen. Never you allow your emotions to control you. Control your emotions. God wants you to be in charge of your emotions. You look at the train system, the train has two heads. When you see a long train coming, there is what they call the caboose. And there is what they call the engine. A good number of us are allowing the caboose to lead us. The caboose is where all the workers of the train sit. The engine is the one that controls the entire train. God wants you to take charge of the engine. He wants you to take charge of your soul, your emotion. And don't allow the caboose of your emotion to be the one leading you. Because it's going to lead you, lead you in all kinds of directions. Today you are happy, you're going to take happy decisions. Today you are sad, you're going to take sad decisions. Today you are filled with anxiety, you're going to take anxiety decisions. No, that is a caboose. The caboose is never meant to drive the train. It is the engine that drives the train. I hope somebody gets this today. Give God some praise in this room. Amen. Well, God bless you for coming. We bless God for his word. God wants you to walk in victory. And as you do so, we're going to prepare seed to be a blessing to the work of God. And so today, if you have your tithe, you have your offerings, I want you to prepare it. And on your screen right now, for those of you that are not in the building, you could sow your seed using Zelle, Cash App, and PayPal. And the tag is LegacySow at gmail.com. Those of you in the building, if you need an envelope, please lift your hands and Osha will bring you one. And I want you to sow your seed in faith and receive because every giver receives. And so I want you to sow your seed in faith, believing that God has a provision of a harvest for you. And as we do so, we're going to have Minister Ike come up and pray over the seed. Amen. lift up your envelope father we thank you we thank you for a good word we thank you for a live word that will shape our future we bless you we thank you father we thank you for what you're doing right here building up a church building up an institution which will direct the generations hereafter we thank you for the privilege also of participating in this vision. So Father, whatever we are given today is what you have already given us. We pray for your blessings on our gifts, tithes and offering, that it will do the job for which you have purposed us to do. We thank you, Father. We bless every individual who is giving today, and even those who are not able to do so today. Those online who have this vision that love legacy must take over. We thank you for your blessings and we thank you for the leadership of this church. We bless your name, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you as you sow your seed. A few announcements as you do so. Um, tomorrow morning, 
we start a week with prayer. I encourage you to join us. The time is 6 o'clock. We're going to be on a prayer line. And um, in the evening, the men will be meeting. The time, 8 o'clock. And don't forget, on Wednesday, we have interactive Bible studies. We are studying the book of Acts. And this week, I'm starting a new series on our Wednesday teaching service. If you've never joined us in our Wednesday teaching service, don't miss it this coming season. I'm going to be doing a four-week series. And I tell you what, you will be empowered in the Word. It's on Zoom virtually, and I look forward to you joining in. And on Friday, we're going to be together praying as well, the time, 7.30. So make sure you join in. Saturday morning, that's the way we start our weekend. We start with prayer, the time, 6 o'clock, and it's going to be over Zoom. And of course, on Sunday, we're going to be in the building, 11 o'clock in the morning. Those of you that are joining virtually as well, 